An air and sea search is continuing for possible survivors of the Edmund Fitzgerald, a 729-foot ore carrier, which apparently broke apart and sunk last night on Lake Superior. The ship and its 29-man crew vanished in a storm with 80-mile-an-hour winds and wave heights up to 25 feet. All that has been found is an oil slick and some debris. On the night of November 10, 1975, the 729-foot-long ore carrier, the SS Edmund Fitzgerald, went down with all 29 hands on board during a strong storm in Lake Superior. So what happened to the Edmund Fitzgerald? We must first learn about the ship before the sinking. The Edmund Fitzgerald is contracted by the Great Lakes Engineering Works of River Road, Michigan, to design and construct a ship within a foot of the maximum length allowed for passage through the soon-to-be-completed St. Lawrence Seaway. However, the ship only costs $7 million to build, so adjust that with the inflation going on. The ship was named after its president and chairman of the board, Mr. Edmund Fitzgerald himself. What's actually very interesting about Mr. Fitzgerald is that his own grandfather and all of his great uncles have also been lake captains as well. And his father owned the Milwaukee Dry Dock Company. On June 8th, 1958, the Edmund Fitzgerald is christened and launched. But however, it was plagued by a series of misfortunes which would be a sign of things to come. Elizabeth Fitzgerald tried to smash a champagne bottle over the bow and it took three tries to break it. Shipyard crews struggled to release the keel blocks, which resulted in a delay of 36 minutes. Not sure if you saw that, but when the Edmund Fitzgerald was launched, the wave actually made a grandstand collapse, and unexpectedly, a spectator had a heart attack and passed away the following day. Now, before we get to the story of the Edmund Fitzgerald, we're actually going to talk about her specifications. So, as we all know, the Edmund Fitzgerald is a Great Lakes freighter with a length of 729 feet with a beam of 75 feet, a draft of 25 feet, and a depth of 39 feet. Now, each depth of every cargo hold is 33 feet. The tonnage weight is 13,632 gross registered tons. And you got 8,713 net registered tonnage which is a volume capacity equal to a volume of 100 cubic feet, which is calculated by subtracting the non-revenue earning spaces. This is basically spaces that are not available for carrying cargo, like for example, crew quarters, which is basically up here, the engine rooms and the fuel tanks are back here as well. The installed power for the ship was a coal-fired Westinghouse Electric Corporation steam turbine at 75,000 horsepower. Actually, 7,500 horsepower, excuse me, which powers 5,600 kilowatts. So she underwent a refit and is converted to oil fuel and the fitting of the automated boiler controls over the winter of 1971 to 1972. She carried 72,000 U.S. gallons of fuel oil and her propulsion would be a single fixed pitch propeller, which is actually located back here where the rudder is which measures in 19.5 feet in length and a top speed of 14 knots or 16 miles per hour. At 729 feet, she was the longest ship on the Great Lakes, which earned her the title the Queen of the Lakes, only to be dethroned by the launch of the 730-foot-long SS Murray Bay. In her career, the company of the Northwestern Mutual purchased ships for operation by other companies, so they signed a 25-year contract with Ogle Bay North Corporation in Ogle Bay Norton designated the ship as a flagship. The Edmund Fitzgerald also became a workhorse herself, breaking the record load for a trip was 27,402 long tons in 1969. That's unbelievable. I can't imagine being on a ship with all that freight on there. So if you're wondering what this ship was actually carrying, the ship carried taconite from Minnesota's Iron Range Mines near Duluth, Minnesota to the ironworks in Detroit, Toledo, and other ports. And loading her would take about four hours, well, actually four and a half hours, and unloading takes a lot more time, which is basically 14 hours. Before we get any further, I'm going to discuss what is a taconite. So a taconite is a banded, low-grain iron formation 
an iron-bearing sedimentary rock in which iron minerals are interlayered with quartz, chert, or carbonate. Now, processing and getting these taconite pellets included the use of using explosives, which were, they would be scooped up with the use of an electric shovel, placed into a giant dump truck as the size of a three-story house, and then later taken to a processing plant, where they will be crushed into small pieces no bigger than a marble by crushing machines, which they will be later separated by using magnetism. So the concentrate is actually rolled with clay inside large rotating cylinders, which actually causes the powder to roll into marble-sized balls and then dried and heated until it's white hot. The pellets are once cooled and loaded into iron ore ships along Lake Superior. They would sail on the Great Lakes to Gary, Indiana, Cleveland, Ohio, and other steel making towns so that way they could be blast furnace and also formed to make steel products. Now the Edmund Fitzgerald actually became a favorite among boat watchers throughout her career but due to her size, appearance, string of records, and of course the DJ captain, which is Captain Peter Pulser, who oversaw trips when cargo records were actually set. He would pipe music day or night over the intercom system while passing through the St. Clair and Detroit rivers. When the SS Edmund Fitzgerald was in the cell locks, he would use a bullhorn to entertain tourists with commentary detail about the ship itself. In 1969, the ship received a safety award for eight years of operation with no time off work injury. But however, fate would actually deal a couple of hands to the Edmund Fitzgerald, and we all know no ship is immune to incidents. So a pro perfect prime example was in that same year where the Edmund Fitzgerald was actually awarded that recognition, the ship actually ran aground in that same year, collided with the SS Hochelaga, and struck the wall of a lock in the same year, and it happened again in 1973 and 1974. You can't get a break for that one. And of course, she actually did lost her anchor in the Detroit River, and, and to this very day, that anchor is actually on display today as we know. However... Fate would also deal another bad hand to the Edmund Fitzgerald. On November 9th in 1975, the Edmund Fitzgerald left Superior, Wisconsin under the command of Captain Ernest Missorley en route to the steel mill on Zug Island near Detroit, Michigan with a load of iron ore, 26,000 tons or more. At 5 p.m., the Edmund Fitzgerald joined a second Great Lakes freighter ship named the Arthur M. Anderson, which is commanded by Captain Jesse B. Cooper, or his nickname would be, is Bernie, which is on its way to Gary, Indiana. But however, the weather forecast is not usual for November time, and the National Weather Service actually did predict that a storm would pass south of Lake Superior by 7 a.m. the next day. And another ship, the SS Wilfred Sykes, loaded opposite of the Edmund Fitzgerald at the Burlington Northern Dock and departed around 4.15 p.m. However, at 7 p.m., the National Weather Service altered its forecast at 7 p.m., issuing Gale's warnings for the whole Lake Superior, thus altering the course of the Anderson and Fitzgerald to go northward seeking shelter along on the Ontario shore. Then they encountered a winter storm, reports winds up to 52 knots or 60 miles per hour, and waves 10 feet high. However, at 2 a.m., the warnings from the National Weather Service upgraded from gale to storm, with winds forecasted of 35 to 50 knots. The Edmund Fitzgerald had followed the Arthur M. Anderson, traveling at a pace of 14.6 miles per hour, but at the next hour, the faster Edmund Fitzgerald actually did pull ahead. At 3.30 p.m., Captain McSorley radioed in to the Arthur M. Anderson, reporting that his ship is taken on water and lost two vent covers at a fence railing and developed a list. Where this list actually happened, we don't know if it was starboard or port. The ship's bilge pumps ran continuously discharging shipped in seawater. So McSorley would slow his ship down so the Anderson can actually close the gap. Afterwards, the United States Coast Guard railed in warning all ships that the sow locks has been closed and should seek safe anchorage. McSorley called the Anderson again reporting radar failure and asked the Arthur Manor and Anderson to keep track of them. 
So the author of Anderson directed the Edmund Fitzgerald to Whitefish Bay Lighthouse. Then at 4.39 p.m., McSorley contacted the U.S. Coast Guard station in Grand Marais, Michigan, asked if the Whitefish Point light and navigational beacons are active. Now, the Coast Guard reported that their monitoring equipment indicated that both instruments were inactive. So McSorley hailed any ships in the area to report the state of the navigational aid, receiving an answer from Captain Cedric Woodard of the Abivores between 5 and 5.30 p.m., saying that the light's on, but not the radio beacon whatsoever. McSorley told Woodward, I have a bad list, I have lost both radars, and I am taking heavy seas over the deck in one of the worst seas I have ever been in. So the winds by late afternoon are now over 50 knots and were recorded by ships at observation points across eastern Lake Superior. The Arthur M. Anderson logged in winds as high as 58 knots at 4.52 p.m., while waves increased as high as 25 feet. So the Anderson was hit by a 70 to 75 knot gust and rogue waves as high as 35 feet. At 7.10 p.m., the Arthur M. Anderson notified the Edmund Fitzgerald of an upbound ship and asked how she was doing. McSorley reported, we are holding our own. And this would be the last time Captain Cooper ever heard from the Edmund Fitzgerald. No distress calls were received and the Anderson lost the ability to reach the Edmund Fitzgerald by radio or to detect her on radar. Therefore, the Edmund Fitzgerald was lost to Lake Superior, taking all 29 hands with her. Now, the U.S. Coast Guard is aware that the Edmund Fitzgerald did went down, but their main focus was on hunting for a 16-foot boat. So, however... And the Coast Guard was completely unaware that the Edmund Fitzgerald has been lost, but Arthur M. Anderson kept saying, hey, the, we have this uh, mighty vessel that just went down over a 16-footer. And we got to keep this in mind, though. The Edmund Fitzgerald just previously went down, and then you had the Arthur M. Anderson right here. He's willing to go back, and, of course, um, yeah, that's a long one because this has a boom on it, so, then again. And again, yeah, still the same name, though. So, the Coast Guard actually did ask any vessel that is within the, the Whitefish Bay area to go back and look for any possible survivors from the Edmund Fitzgerald. The Anderson would lead the charge. One more actually did went back, which is the, uh, the William Clay Ford, which is also another Great Lakes freighter, which is unfortunately scrapped to this very day. It's power that you can actually still see to this very day though. But however, despite the helicopters, despite the search planes, even the Canadian Coast Guard and the Ontario Police actually did got involved in the search, they would not be able to find the Edmund Fitzgerald unfortunately due to his sinking. However, the search actually did consider some debris recovery, but they actually did found a lifeboat and a couple of rafts as well. But unfortunately, none of the 29 crew members were actually found. Four days later, after the sinking of the SS Edmund Fitzgerald, the United States Navy Lockheed D-3 Orion aircraft, which is actually piloted by Lieutenant George Connor and equipped with to detect magnetic anomalies, usually that are associated with submarines, actually did found the wreck of the SS Edmund Fitzgerald laying about 15 miles west of Deadman's Cove, Ontario, northwest of Pancake Bay Provincial Park. A further survey by the U.S. Coast Guard using a side-scan sonar actually did reveal two large objects lying close together on the lake floor. The Navy also contracted Seaward Incorporated to incorporate a second survey between November 22nd and 25th. So what actually did ha how the wreck was actually discovered and they actually did found that the ship did broken too by the way. What you see is the wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald. As you can see both pieces are separated at 170 feet between and both halves are about 253 to 275 each 
with the bow pointing down at 125 degrees and the stern, even though upside down, pointing with the rudder at 255. Surrounding the ship is a debris field, which is mostly the taconite that we actually did discuss earlier ago in the documentary. This basically came out of the cargo holds and basically spilled out onto the bed of Lake Superior. So that was a so that was a note now. Oh, in 1980 during a Lake Superior research dive expedition, if you remember the name of Jacques Cousteau, who discovered the HMHS Britannic in the Mediterranean waters, his son Jean-Michel Cousteau sent ex sent out two divers from the Arve Calypso, which is the first man submersible dive to the SS Edmund Fitzgerald. It was basically brief, even though that they drew no final conclusion. They did say that the, but they did speculate that the Edmund Fitzgerald had broken up on the surface. I pretty much say that it was actually impact with the bottom, since you gotta remember this: the Edmund Fitzgerald is 729 feet long. The depth of where it sank was only 530 feet of water. It's like the Britannic sinking in 400 feet of water. So, therefore now, diving to the wreck is very off limit. You, the families actually did want to recognize the ship as a memorial to the ones that did die. And diving to this wreck is strictly off limit. Now that we got the story of the Edmund Fitzgerald out of the way, there are many different thinking theories about the Edmund Fitzgerald, and there are many different possibilities. So I'm actually going to go in order of what it is from 1 to 6. So the first one is the waves and the weather. The Edmund Fitzgerald sank at the eastern edge of the high wind area where the long fetch or distance of the winds that blew over the water. However, they actually did produce waves averaging 23 feet, and 1 in 100 waves actually did reach 36. And 1 out of every 1,000 actually did reach 46 feet. And this is what actually did cause the Edmund Fitzgerald right here to uh, roll heavily with the, the waves. Another one, speaking of the winds and the weather and the waves, we actually do have rogue waves. However, there was actually a series of three different rogue waves was actually reported within the vicinity at the time she sank. And this phenomenon is set to occur on Lake Superior and refers to a sequence of three waves that are one-third larger than actually the normal ones. The first one actually puts an enormously large amount of water onto the deck, like so. Or actually, like so. Oh, now pretend my hand is the waves. Way go anyway. And this actually makes the water unable to drain quickly before the second one would actually strike. And then the third one actually accumulates a backwash and overloads the deck with too much water. However, the Arthur M. Anderson right here here actually did report some rogue waves that were actually in the area though. So keep this in mind though. Keep the rogue wave ones in mind. Another one is the cargo hold flooding. Now, a couple of years after the disaster, the United States Coast Guard Marine Casualty Report suggests that the accident was actually caused by ineffective hatch closures. And for those that don't know about the hatches, these are these uh, guys right here. The report actually did indicate that these hatches were not closed properly and failed to prevent the waves from inundating the cargo hold, but there's actually video footage of the wreck that actually does show that her hatch clamps are in perfect condition though. But I may have to contradict that one because if you look at the wreck today, there are a couple of cargo hatches on the bow half that basically came off, which basically means that once those hatches came off, that water is clear to go in. Another one is shoaling rather than the hatch cover leakage. The probable cause of the loss of the Edmund Fitzgerald was the shawling or the grounding at the Six Phantom Shoal northwest of Caribou Island while the vessel unknowingly raked a reef. So that means the bow hit the reef and just kept going, possibly tore something along where the keel is, 
and basically all it does is basically once once the ship goes up and down, basically it's going to force more water inside. Kind of like with the HMHS Britannic, when it was still moving, thus adding in more water as the ship is still moving. Another one is structural failure. This one is, is very, very possible. Now, the Edmund Fitzgerald actually does have a weakened structure and modification to the winter load line for the Edmund Fitzgerald made it possible for large waves to cause a stress fracture in the hull. For those that don't know what a stress fracture is, it's basically like if you try bending the ship, you're actually putting more and more stress onto the hull itself. And it'll basically cause it to tear apart and just damage a deck or two. Kind of like with the RMS Titanic. During its final moments, when the stern was rise out of the water, and then all of a sudden, from top on down, the structural stress is just too great for the ship, causing it to split in two. This is actually possible for a large wave to cause a stress, stress fracture in the hull. And this actually did happen on two different cases, though. One of them would be the Carl D. Bradley, and the other one would be the SS Daniel J. Morrell. And they both sang in 1958 and 1966, respectively. Another one is topside damage. The U.S. Coast Guard actually cited this as a reasonable alternative cause reason, summarizing that the loss in the damage of the fence rail and vents is actually caused by heavy floating objects, you know, such as a log or, or something, anything that is not secured, or knocked into the ship and is basically up on the top, it's basically going to cause some, some damage. So this actually did cause... The vents to result in flooding a two ballast tank and a walk-in tunnel, oh, and which actually did cause the ship to lift to one side and then to another. And this was experienced very, very early, and then it was later compounded by the, the heavy seas. So basically, any openings with that topside damage basically means that more water is going to be fl flooding in. So, this is the way I see it. One of them was the topside damage part, and the second one is basically going to be the cargo hold flooding, which means that the hatches are already damaged, and then you have the rogue waves. The rogue waves add on the more water into the cargo hatch, and as the ship kind of kind of gets rocked with the waves kind of going from one side to another, and then all of a sudden, of course, that third and final one causes the bow to go down and then and of course with this one I can actually split it in two this actually simulates and then once the bow digs into the floor of Lake Superior this basically causes the stern to break off freely with the bow now levels to the ground and then the stern just kind of kind of goes back underneath the water just upside down to which is actually visible to this very day because this is we know how the wreck actually did look and of course with the waves pounding on the cargo hatches causes the latches to fail as well before the ship did went under so any more openings if the water finds more openings it'll basically go in and just basically weigh the ship down and the ship will go under so that's the way that I kind of see it for myself. I know a lot of us do have different opinions. If you actually do have an opinion on how the Edmund Fitzgerald sank, do feel free to leave it down in the description below because I like to hear about it and see if I can respect or debate depending on your theory. Now, we're actually going to be respectful about different theories. I know some of us are heavily opinionated. The day after the sinking of the SS Edmund Fitzgerald, in the musty old hall of the old maritime, of the old Mariner's Church in Detroit, rang the bell 29 times for each man on the Edmund Fitzgerald. Today, that tradition still continues every year, as they hold an annual memorial of reading the names of each crewman. Even after the death of Gorn Lightfoot, 
on May 1st of 2023, recently this year, the church bell would do its normal chime of 29 times, plus an additional one in memory of Lightfoot. Makes it a grand total of 30. And however, since we're on about Gordon Lightfoot, a song by the Ontario singer-songwriter Gordon Lightfoot composed and recorded the song directed to the Edmund Fitzgerald in 1976 for his album Summertime Dream. Today, you can actually still hear that song you know, on streaming services like YouTube or Spotify, Amazon Music, iTunes, wherever you listen to music at. However, the ship's bell was recovered from the wreck in 1995, and a replica engraved with the names of the 29 sailors who died replaced the original one. A legal document signed by the relatives of the deceased, officials of the Mariners Church of Detroit, and the Great Lakes Shipwreck Historical Society incorporated a permanent memorial to honor the 29. And today, this bell is actually on display at the Great Lakes Shipwreck Museum in Whitefish Point. So, in conclusion, I thank you guys for watching this video. We certainly did a great job honoring the 29 sailors and, of course, Gordon Lightfoot that are lost, either in the sinking, and we know Gordon Lightfoot was not a part of the sinking, even though that he did the song. And I, I just have a lot of respect for Gordon Lightfoot for doing that. So. I thank him for his memory of doing that song, and if you, if you also like to hear some more mar maritime stories, let me know. Let me know down in the description below if you like these kind of videos of what I'm going to be doing in the future. Just let me know, and I'll think of another one I'm going to do. Now, keep in mind, I, and this was actually a project, something I want to do for a long time, so. If you like it, leave a like, comment, subscribe to this channel for more for possible maritime history videos. I will try to do another one soon, so can't make heads or tails of it. So anyway, once again, my name is Dustin. I'll see you guys in another video.